Hi everyone! In this video, I'm going to show you how to extract a fragment of DNA from an agarose gel. So for example, let's say you were cloning a new gene into a plasmid. You'd probably amplify that gene with PCR first. Then you'd run the PCR reaction on a gel just to make sure that you had the desired product and to separate it from any other template DNA, uh, which is great. Let's say you've got a nice bright band there, but now you need to get it out of the gel for the next steps. This is how you would do that. So let's start with an overview of the process. You'd probably start with a uh, gel that looks something like this. You've got a sample with multiple fragments of DNA in it, um, but you only want this band right here. Now, first of all, you want to make sure that you've run the gel long enough to where you've got ample separation between these two bands here. Okay, you want to be able to confidently cut out this band without touching any of the others. Because if you touch the other bands while you're cutting out yours, uh, then you might have some contamination of another fragment, and that DNA sequence might ultimately end up in your plasmid. All right, so anyways, uh, once you've separated those bands, you can cut out that band as a gel slice, and then you're going to melt that gel slice at around 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. That's going to give you this liquid solution right here. And then we're going to isolate the DNA from this solution, which, by the way, would contain other impurities like agarose, ethidium bromide, and a few other things um, that are in the buffer that we use to dissolve the gel. We want to purify the DNA, so we transfer it to a spin column here. Now that spin column contains a silica resin that's going to bind the DNA. So if we load our sample onto that column and then centrifuge, 13,000 RPM or 12,000 G uh, for about one minute, the liquid will go straight through. And most of the impurities will go straight through that resin as well. But your DNA will stay bound to that resin. But even so, there's still a few other things that we'd like to get rid of from the resin. So we add a wash buffer to that column and then spin again. So that's going to get rid of the rest of the impurities, leaving us with only DNA on the column. Then we can elute the DNA from the column just by adding uh, 25 to 50 microliters of elution buffer. Um, that could be ultra pure water is sufficient to get the DNA off the column, for example. But we add that, spin one more time, and then what comes out in the bottom is your purified, isolated uh, fragment of DNA from the gel. So there you go. That's everything from start to finish. <clears throat> so now let's actually uh, see what this looks like. So first of all, before you get started, you want to take your water bath and preheat it to about 60 degrees Celsius or whatever the manufacturer of your kit recommends. Um, but it will take time to heat the water bath up, so you want to make sure you do that first. Then you can go to your gel, make sure you've isolated your bands, you've separated them enough to where you can cut them out. And then uh, we're going to actually cut out the gel, so we need to put on some special PPE here. We want to put on a face mask that's got plastic on it that blocks UV light. You also want to be using uh, gloves and long sleeves here to make sure that UV doesn't touch your skin. At any rate, what you want to do here is start cutting out that gel with a spatula. Now I want to mention here a few key things. Uh, first of all, when you're cutting out the gel slice, you don't need to use a razor blade. You'll see razor blades pop up in a lot of different protocols uh, because razor blades are very good at cutting things. Um, unfortunately, though, they're also very good at scratching the surface of the transilluminator here. So over time, if we use razor blades, it cuts up that surface too, and then that can lower the quality of the gel images that you can get from these gels. <clears throat> so for that reason, we just use a spatula. It's safer. It doesn't cut the... Uh, or scratch the surface of the transilluminator, and it still works. All you have to do is uh, poke the gel, um, and it will yield. Um, another thing that I'd like to mention here is that you should thoroughly clean this spatula before cutting out your gel slice, just to make sure that uh, the last person that used it, you're not getting uh, their DNA sample in your DNA sample, and getting cross-contamination that way. So you just want to spray the uh, spatula with uh, some 75% ethanol before you cut out your band here. And when you're cutting out your band, you want to be very careful to make sure that you're not touching the other bands. If you're not absolutely sure of that, then run the sample, run the gel longer. Okay, but there we go. It's really just as simple as that. Uh, you're going to cut out the gel uh, with a spatula and then transfer that slice to a tube. 
But before you put the slice in the tube, what you want to do is you want to take it over to your balance and tear the balance to the weight of that tube because we're going to have to weigh the mass of this gel slice before proceeding. So tear the balance to the tube, then take your spatula. You can turn the UV light off at this point and pick up the gel slice from the gel and transfer it into the tube. You might also want to take this opportunity to cut the gel into tinier pieces uh, because the, the more surface area you have here, the faster it will melt later. Okay, so I want to take that tube plus gel and now weigh it. So in this case, I have a gel slice that weighs 272 milligrams. Now you want to weigh or you want to write that down because it's going to determine how much solubilization buffer we're going to add in the next step. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add three microliters of gel solubilization buffer for every milligram of gel slice that I have. So in this example, I had 270 milligrams of gel slice. So that means I would need to add three times 270, which would be 810 microliters of gel solubilization solution to that sample. So that's what I'm doing here. Uh, another example would be if I had a 100 milligram slice of gel, I would add 300 microliters of solubilization solution. Now it is worth pointing out that if you have a particularly large gel slice, or if you have multiple gel slices that containing the similar uh, DNA fragment, um, you might not be able to add the corresponding amount of gel solubilization solution to a single tube. So let's, for example, say that I've got a 500 milligram slice of gel. If it's 500 milligrams, I would need to add 1,500 microliters of gel solubilization solution to that tube. And 500 milligrams takes up around 500 microliters of space anyways. So that would mean I would be putting 2 milliliters into a tube that can only accommodate about 1.7 ml, so it would overflow. Now, if you have that situation, then what you need to do is take your spatula, remove some of the gel from this tube, and transfer it to another. Weigh those tubes again, and then add the corresponding amount of solubilization solution to each tube to prevent them from overflowing. Now, it's perfectly fine to do this because all we're doing at this step is we're melting the gel. And then once we have everything melted, we can recombine all of these samples onto a single spin column. So everything will end up on the same column, but for now we might need to split it into separate tubes just to uh, prevent these solutions from overflowing. Okay, so with all that being said, now I'm going to add the solubilization solution to the gel. It's a good idea to poke the gel at this point just to make sure it's uh, spread into a bunch of tiny little chunks so that will melt faster. But here we go. I've added the solubilization solution. I'm going to put the tube onto a floating rack. Don't just throw a tube into a water bath because uh, it might leak. Um, but I'm going to keep it there for a few minutes. I'm going to vortex it occasionally just to speed up the melting process. But after about five to 10 minutes, this is what you should see. An absolutely clear yellow solution with no trace of gel. You want to look at it carefully just to make sure there's no gel floating around. If there is, keep melting it. But if you get to this point, then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add one microliter of isopropyl alcohol for every milligram of the original gel slice. So here in this example, I started off with 270 milligrams of gel, so I'm adding 270 microliters of isopropyl alcohol to the solution here. Now, again, it is possible that that might overflow your tube. So if necessary, before you add isopropyl alcohol, split your sample into two separate tubes, then add the corresponding amount of isopropyl to each one. All right, just be thinking about uh, if the tube is going to overflow, make sure that it does not. Um, but the reason we're adding isopropyl alcohol here is because we want to make the DNA less soluble in this solution. Now what that's going to do then is once we put the sample onto the column that contains the silica resin, the DNA will actually prefer to be on that resin than in the solution that contains alcohol. 
So this is a pretty common technique. Anytime we want to force DNA out of solution, we just add uh, and a corresponding amount of uh, alcohol. It could be ethanol, isopropyl alcohol, either one. And we'll see that it either precipitates or it binds to a resin rather than being in the mobile phase. If we left the sample in aqueous solution, so just this gel solubilization buffer without any alcohol, then what would happen is it would never bind to the resin. So it's very important to say here that you are to remember to add this isopropyl alcohol. If you forget this step, you're going to lose all of your sample. You're going to be throwing it out in the waste. Which leads me to my next point. My next reminder is that this yellow solution here, don't forget, contains ethidium bromide, which is a carcinogen. The ethidium bromide was in the gel. You melted the gel into this solution, so now it contains ethidium bromide. Please use caution when handling that sample. If you spill it on your gloves or on your skin, get new gloves or rinse your skin thoroughly, okay? But treat this sample as if it's pure ethidium bromide and be very careful with it. Okay, now that we have our sample melted, we can move on to the next step. So the next thing we're gonna do here is prepare for the purification. I'm gonna take a spin column, put it into a fresh collection tube, and then I'm going to prepare it for binding DNA by adding 500 microliters of column binding buffer. There are some kits where uh, you don't have to do this, but in this uh, kit here, you do add the column uh, binding buffer, and that just wets the resin, gets it ready to accept the DNA. At any rate, uh, you're gonna put that column into the centrifuge, balance it with an appropriate blank, and then spin at 12,000 G for one minute. All right, after that spin is done, what you should see is that the liquid has all gone through the column and is now in the bottom of the collection tube. And we're just going to decant that into a waste vial and replace the spin column. At this point, the column's ready to bind DNA. So I'm going to transfer my sample, uh, 800 microliters at a time, onto that column. Now, it's very likely that you'll have more than 800 microliters. So what we'll do here is we will just add the first 800 microliters to the column spin it again at 12,000 G for one minute, and then we'll discard uh, whatever comes out of the tube and load more of your sample onto the same column. But it's very important again to remember here that what's coming through that column contains some ethidium bromide from the original gel. So when I take this sample out and I decant whatever's in the collection tube, I need to decant that into a specifically labeled ethidium bromide waste container, like the 50 ml tube that I have shown here. But at any rate, once you have that done, you can uh, load another 800 microliters of your sample onto the column. And you can do this as many times as you wish. So if you had four ml of sample, then you'd do this five times. You'd spin, uh, decant the ethidium bromide waste, and then load more sample over and over and over again. Uh, the only thing I should mention is that if you have an excessive amount of sample you're putting onto this column, there are some salts that will accumulate on the resin and then co-elute with the DNA at the end. So you might actually have a higher salt concentration if you put too much uh, sample onto these columns. But anyways, I'm finished loading my sample here. So the next step is to add wash solution to that column, 500 microliters to be exact and then spin it again. But I want to pause right here and uh, make a very important note that that wash solution is shipped without ethanol in it, which means if you don't add ethanol to this wash solution, then you're adding an aqueous uh, buffer to that column and your DNA will actually fall off. If and only if the wash solution contains the prescribed amount of ethanol, refer to the manufacturer's uh, instructions uh, for exact amounts there, um, but if and only if it contains ethanol, will we remove impurities from the column while leaving DNA bound to the resin, okay? So you want to make absolutely sure that ethanol is in that bottle before you add wash solution to the column. If it's a new kit, best practice is to open up the kit and immediately add the ethanol. All right, then you can check the box that's on the bottle there, and every subsequent user knows that ethanol is in that solution. Um, but just as a safeguard, it's also a good idea to open up that bottle and waft 
to see if you can smell the ethanol is present, just to be absolutely sure that you're not going to lose your sample here. All right, but there you go. As long as ethanol is in that wash buffer, you can add it to the column and then spin at 12,000 G for another minute. And again, what this should do is the DNA should remain bound to the resin since there's ethanol in this buffer, but other impurities should wash straight through. One of those impurities might be ethidium bromide, so whenever you decant for this, you want to decant into the ethidium bromide waste. All right. Um, but then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to spin that same column again at 12,000 G for one minute. We're not adding any new buffer here. What we're doing is we're just trying to make sure that we remove as much ethanol from that column as possible before we elute our DNA, because ethanol can interfere with downstream reactions. So once I'm sure that I've removed the ethanol, I transfer my column to a new Eppendorf tube, and then I add 25 to 50 microliters of elution buffer very carefully to the center of that column. All right, so you want to make sure that the elution buffer all goes into the column. Um, but I want to point out a few things here before we move on. To increase the amount of DNA that you extract from this column, what, you, what your recovery would be, it's best practice to preheat the elution solution to about 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. So you've already got that water bath warmed up to melt the gel. You might as well put the elution solution in there as well. The hotter it is, the more DNA you're going to uh, get off of the column. Another thing you can do is once you add the elution solution to the column, you can let it sit there for one to two minutes. Again, the longer it sits there, the more DNA you're going to dissolve now into the mobile phase. Uh, gel extraction kits are notorious for giving uh, very low yields from the initial amount of uh, DNA that you put on there. Um, you might only get something like 10 to 20 percent uh, that elutes off of this column into the final sample. So anything you can do here to increase the amount that you're eluting would definitely be a good idea. Okay, so all that being said, what we're going to do now is we're going to take that uh, column, which by the way the lid might not close, but don't worry about that, and we're going to spin it for an additional 12,000 G for one minute. And then what comes out of here will be a tube which contains at the bottom your purified DNA. Now quick note here, if you put 50 microliters onto the column, this might only be 40 to 45 microliters. You don't get all of the liquid back off the column. Um, but the uh, most of your DNA um, should be in that column. Most of your volume should be there. All right, so that's it. The next thing you would want to do is uh, take that sample and quantify how much DNA uh, you have there, and then you can move on to any downstream application. There you go.